A few years ago, I was in Prague with a couple of my friends. We were backpacking across Eastern Europe and Prague was the second stop. It had been a long train ride in from Amsterdam, so we went out to start celebrating quite early. I, in particular, probably went a little too hard too fast. By 10 p.m. I was quite drunk. The next few parts of the night are still a blur, but somehow I left my friends and found myself walking around on the street outside the bar we had been in. Something happened, rather I probably did something, but that started an altercation of sorts with a random stranger. We were able to mesh it quite peacefully, but not after some loud noises and causing quite a scene. I decided to walk away to kind of just get away from the area in case any trouble arrived. I was walking down a quiet side alley that I remember from earlier in the day that led to my hotel when an unmarked white van creeped past me. Now mind you, my friends and I had idiotically just watched all two of the hostile movies before we had left for Europe, so that whole kidnapping thing was still fresh in my mind. I started walking faster and faster, almost coming to a running pace when I thought I was just overreacting and that the van was long gone. Less than a few seconds later, I heard brakes screeching behind me and turned to see three large guys were running towards me in the same white van parked right behind them. They grabbed me and threw me inside the van before I even knew what was going on. I was completely terrified at this point and tried to reason with the four guys in the van, but they didn't speak a lick of English, or at least didn't respond to my pleas. We drove a few blocks until we came to a stoplight, and I decided this is my chance to make a break for it or else I was completely screwed. I dove over one of the guys sitting next to me and straight out the van door that I somehow managed to open fairly quickly. I got maybe half a block before the guy caught up to me and tackled me. I looked around and tried to scream to any onlookers to help, but of course there was no one around to be seen. They handcuffed me in the van the rest of the way. We got to some building, very old, and the hallways we walked in looked old and dilapidated. I was still freaking out too much to think sanely or get any real bearing of the place. They tried talking to me for a bit, but I couldn't make out the few English words they said to me, so they took me to a prison cell-esque room and started tying me down on a bed. There was blood on the headrest of this bed, and this was the moment I started realizing that something really bad was going to happen to me from that point on. They left to go do something for a few minutes, and in those few minutes, it was life or death for me. Still to this day, I look back at those few minutes and really admire myself and what I tried to do. You always think that when you are in a life or death situation, you will fight to survive any which way you can, but you don't really know until you are actually in one. I started trying to take off the straps immediately. There were two on my wrists, and two around my ankles. I kicked and wiggled and did everything that was humanly possible to get out of those leather shackles. I was able to get off the two feet shackles within a few minutes and started focusing on everything I had on my wrists. I have never fought harder to do anything in my entire life. I was fully convinced that in a few minutes, I would be dead if I didn't get this done right at this moment. Somehow, I was able to get the shackles off my wrists while skinning them in the process. I had blood pouring out of cuts from both my wrists and ankles but I was free of them. I went over to the window and punched right through it, but to my utter dismay, there were bars behind it. There was nothing I could do. I was completely trapped with no chance of escape. My captors heard the commotion and came running into the room. They grabbed me and tied me down to the bed again, and this time put one strap over my chest, leaving me effectively unable to wiggle or move. This was it. I was done for. In the next few moments, I made peace with death for the first time in my life. A beautiful wave of peace washed through my entire body, and I laid in my bed feeling completely okay with the world. I thought about my parents and friends, and hoped that they would at least learn of my death and not be left wondering what happened to me. I thought about my dog, and hoped that she wouldn't think I'd just abandoned her. I thought about quite a few things, but all with a peaceful heart. An hour, or what felt like an hour, passed, and no one came. I thought for sure they would have began skinning me alive by this point or whatever sick torture device they would have chosen for me. As I was counting down the final minutes of my life, the rusted metal door swung open and a bald man who had to be in his thirties walked in. I begged him to let me go and to my surprise, it seemed like he was at least partially understanding what I was saying. I told him that I have a family back at home who needs me, and made up just about anything I could think of to make him feel some sort of sympathy for me. He seemed like the only one who spoke a lick of English, and by this point I could tell he could understand me. He put his hand up to his lip, notioning for me to be quiet, and began unstrapping me from the bed. He opened the door and looked out in the hallway, and turned towards me and said, Come. He led me down the hallway just a few feet towards an exit. He opened the door and said, Go, run. 
I never ran faster in my life. I was eventually able to get my bearings again as I sobered up and made it back to the bar where I originally was, to find my friends who were panicked, wondering where I was. I'm not sure if anyone else that has had this happen to them survived, and I still to this day don't know where I was. But the fact that I'm alive and well today is enough for me to accept it and move on. I was seven, my friend, who we'll call Dan, had just turned eight a few days before. It was the summer of 1998, and Dan and I were playing basketball at the local park with the new basketball he had gotten from his parents. The basketball court at our park was on the back corner and was backed up against a street in a fenced-in field, while being out of view to the rest of the park due to the hills between it. A maroon Buick Regal from the late 80s pulled up and three guys got out of the car. We didn't pay much attention to them because it was a public park and we were used to older guys coming and taking over the basketball courts, considering we could barely throw the ball high enough to make a shot. One of the guys walked around to the back of the court and stood in the back entrance and then one of the other two guys came into the court as the other guy stood in the front entrance. We continued to ignore them and played basketball on our half of the court. The guy that came in took the ball and said we were going to come with him. We freaked out and started trying to run to the other side of the court. He caught Dan and took him over to one of his buddies. Then he threw the ball and hit me in the back, knocking me over. He picked me up and they put us in the back seat of the Regal. Two of the guys sat back there with us. We were screaming and yelling, but no one was around at 11 a.m. that day. They drove us about 10 miles north of the city limits to an old dirt road, then drove another three or four miles down a dirt road to an old two-story house. It had one of those old basements with bulkhead doors. They literally threw us down there and then locked the doors on us. It was dark and smelled like something had died. We heard them drive off. Dan had one of those squeeze lights that looked like a Bic lighter he had bought earlier that morning when we went to the convenience store and bought breakfast. We looked around the room for a bit and there was a bunch of canning stuff down there. We tried to push the door open with no luck. The day went along and we were stuck. It never entered my mind at the time that we were in serious danger. In fact, the only thing I was worried about was getting in trouble if I didn't come home to check in. Evening came and we heard another vehicle drive up. Then we heard the Regal drive up as well. We could hear the guys and someone else yelling out in the yard, then the door to the house slammed. We could hear people walking around the wooden Ford house. The sun went down and we began to really freak out. We knew that if we yelled, the guys who brought us here would come get us and that would be worse than just being left alone. The flashlight was about dead from an entire day's worth of use, but we had found a phone jack that had been run down there and we also found an old broken phone. We plugged it in and got a dial tone, but we could not dial it. Dan remembered watching a MacGyver earlier and they called 911 by hanging up the phone in a sequence of 9 short times then a pause, then another short click followed by a pause and then another short beep. It took us about an hour to get it to work and the police answered. We were in full on panic at that point, but we told them where we were and what had happened. They asked us who our parents were and how they could get a hold of them. We gave them their numbers. They said to try to hide and wait, so we did. After five minutes, we heard some faint sirens in the distance and they sounded like they were getting closer. Then they stopped. About ten minutes later, we heard a few cars pull up. Then a police officer on a loudspeaker said, Come out with your hands up. You are surrounded. About twenty minutes went by, then we heard someone banging on the cellar doors. We hid just in case it was not a cop. The doors flew open and the brightest lights I'd ever seen were shining in on us. Three cops came in with guns pointed and identified us. They carried us out and put us in an unmarked police car. My mom was in the front seat and Dan's mom was in the back seat. For about eight months, well into the school year, we would have to go to court and testify about what happened on occasion. I believe to this day that that was the smell of someone else they had kidnapped and killed. The three guys ended up getting 15 year sentences and the people that lived at the house got like three years in prison for not reporting the guys. The guys who kidnapped us did not really say much to us. They were rough but didn't really harm us. It was not until I was an adult that I realized what had happened and the danger I was in. I was happy that I didn't fully comprehend what had happened because me and Dan went on and lived the rest of our childhood out as normal kids. We were just a bit more cautious of people. Just to give a little background about myself, I'm a 28 year old male and have served in the military. A couple years ago I was flying from Hawaii into a city where my friend lives to visit him. He was an old friend that I served with and we hadn't seen or hung out with each other in years. My friend was out of town and wasn't getting in until the next morning because he travels all the time for work, so he arranged for a car service to pick me up from the airport and drive me the 15 minutes to his house. 
After arriving at the airport, I got my luggage and walked outside to wait for the car. It was freezing cold. I waited around for the driver for over an hour. I eventually contacted my friend to see where my driver was. He contacted the company and responded, telling me that the driver was waiting for me at the east end of the lot in a black four-door sedan. As I approached the east end of the lot, a black sedan pulled up alongside me and said they were the car service to get me. Sweet, I said. I was worried I wouldn't find you. The guy got out and took my bags and threw them in the trunk. I hopped in the back seat and he got back in up front and we started driving off. I was half dead between flying 14 plus hours and then waiting in the cold for him to show up. It had been a crazy long day for me, plus I wasn't super familiar with the city, it was late. I was leaned back and the driver was chatting with me and I was responding to most of the stuff he said saying, uh huh and yeah, in the right places. He then started talking about some crazy stuff, how he was in the military and that they were killing soldiers for the government and a bunch of other outlandish stuff. I was like, hey, you know PTSD is real and it's nothing to be ashamed of. I serve too. I know DOD has programs to help people. Maybe talking to someone would help. He was going on about how they weren't helping him. They were tracking him and they bugged his house. I then got a text from my friend whose house I was heading to asking where I was going. I replied, to your house, why? And he messaged back saying, no, you're going in the opposite direction. He was using Find My Friends to track me from the airport so he could turn on the lights, heater, and disable his alarm system for when I got to his house. He noticed my little dot was moving away from his house. He called the police and kept following my dot on the map, and we drove into this state park in the middle of nowhere. The car was surrounded by cops, lights, sirens, everything. The police detained him and searched the car. The guy had duct tape, a tarp, and a knife in a bag along with a complete change of clothes. He was arrested. The police asked if I was okay and I said I was fine but just really hungry since I hadn't eaten anything since before my flight left. They took me to a drive through and got me a hamburger and then took me to my friend's house who forgot to turn on the heater since he was distracted by this whole string of events. I had to deal with the legal stuff a little later. When I got back home, I had to go make a statement at the police department where I lived that was recorded and sent to them, but I'm glad I made it out safe and unharmed.